you all for being here. I know uh, the holiday seasons are upon us and so forth, and um, very excited that uh, we're coming to this conclusion here today because um, we're going to start doing some work come January. Uh, so excited about that part. But before we open it up to the rest of our agenda, I'd like to ask Rabbi Bloom to say a uh, little blessing. Thank you for putting me on the spot. But, uh, <laughs> you know, in the um, book of Genesis, it says God created uh, man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created male and female. He created them. It tries to show us that each of us uh, are individuals, but in the end, each of us come together as a community. In this season and festival of life, let us beseech God that he should bring warmth into our lives that he should allow us to be a beacon unto others and the lights of our Hanukkah lights, our Christmas trees, and all the winter solstice and holidays should be a beacon that we walk towards that of equality and equity, that of fairness and community, and that each and every one of us should be able to light the path, not only of ourselves, our families, but for our entire community as we reach out for the morality of life and the goodness within us and the ability to bring goodness around us as well. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Amen. Uh, opening remarks, so I'll go with Bob Ray. So if you have any remarks you'd like to make. <laughs> just quickly, I'd just like to say to um, all of you who have agreed to serve as chairs of committees and on committees, we thank you because that's where the work really begins. Uh, you've got a job to do in analyzing a bunch of material. I've looked at some of mine today, and the stack is about this high, just with what we've gathered already. And I'm sure you're going to be gathering more. So we're depending on you, the community is depending on you. I'm looking forward to attending some of these committee meetings, see where we go, but really looking forward to see what recommendations we come up with uh, for the city. So. Thank you for taking on extra work that you probably didn't think you were going to do us to do, but uh, it's, it's more work, and I appreciate you for doing that. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just wish everyone a happy holiday season. Each and every one of us are blessed by the fact that we have a home to go to in the evenings. Each and every one of us are blessed that we have the fellowship of each other. I hope that we're able to bring that blessings to others. So on behalf of myself, uh, my community, my family, I wish all of you all of God's blessing and support and more. And I, I did know what uh, Barbara has said about you know, your volunteering to you know, take lead of some of the committees and serve. But some of you who have not signed up, we do have room for participation, and we hope that you will participate on one or two committees. And uh, thank you again for that. Uh, the next thing on our agenda is the approval of minutes uh, from the November 20th task force meeting. I hope you all had a chance to review those. Those were sent out by email to you earlier. And I'll welcome a motion to accept. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, number four is an update on community conversations. So Estrus and Angela. I'm going to invite Angela's voice to go first. She's done an incredible job with, with the charts and everything that you, we've reviewed before. Uh, just welcome her updates, and then I'll have some, some remarks. So under tab one in your binders, um, towards the back, there is a chart. It'll be after, and it looks like this. It's a summary of, our, of participant statistics. Get there. So... Yep. Do, do, do. Yeah. I'll try and see. Is that better? If not, I'll just project. <laughs> okay. So this data was collected by those that filled out the participant questionnaire online and also by those that signed in at community conversations and or filled out participant questionnaires at community conversations. So we had 330, uh, 332 entries, and of those, the majority were entered online, 210, 122 were manually entered. 
Um, of those, the people that filled out online, they, they were asked the question, were you invited to participate in a conversation? And of those that responded, um, 146 said yes, and 64 said no. Now, I do want to say of the 64 that said no, I drilled down on that data additionally, and really some of those actually ended up attending a couple of conversations. So we're really down to 42 that's, that have not attended a conversation that I can tell from a sign-in sheet. And not everyone that filled out the participant questionnaire actually filled out every item on there. Some provided addresses, some didn't. Some provided contact information, some did not. And some did not provide the demographic information. So I'm just going to give you the information on what we do have. So on the second page, you will see a map. This map is of those that actually uh, attended a community conversation. So you can see that it's pretty well dispersed within the inner city. We do have a lack of participation in far north Fort Worth, which is, when I say that, that is outside of the loop. And we also probably have uh, not as much participation far west. But everywhere else, there, there's pretty good participation so far. And we do have additional conversations that will be occurring. Um, we will be having um, a couple of them at uh, Hazel Harvey Peace in January. And so if you have not been able to attend one and you did sign up, you will be getting an invitation. You still have an opportunity to sign up by going to onefortworth.org. Is that correct, Michelle? And you could submit a participant questionnaire there also. Now, under the demographic information, of, of the 332, 284 provided demographic information and 48 did not. So of those that did, you can see the age range. There's a pretty consistent age range, 25 to 34, we had 52 participants. Uh, 35 to 44, we had 58. 45 to 54, we had 47. 55 to 64, we had 62. 65 to 74, we had 45 participants, and then 51 did not provide information. So of those that did, it's pretty dispersed um, towards the middle. We don't have a, we only had five participants in the 18 to 24. We had three that were actually under the age of 18, and we had nine that were 75 or older. Under race and ethnicity, um, the majority of those that have, ten, have attended are African American. And then the next is white or Caucasian, and then Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish. And then actually we had a really good representation from Asian or Pacific Islander. Um, and then you can see the rest of, we had one, he, one person that said Hebrew, another one that said Haitian American, we had two Native Americans. But the majority are those three main categories, African American, Hispanic, Spanish, or Latino, or white or Caucasian. Education, you can really see a, a big gap there. The majority of the attendees either had a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. Um, of bachelor's, we had 83. Master's, 86. Um, we had 24 doctorates, um, 18 professional, and then 34 some college graduate. But there is, you can see that if, if you didn't have the higher education, there was probably a little less participation in these community conversations. Under marital status, the majority were married or domestic partnership. We had 166. 71 indicated they were single, um, and 30 indicated they were divorced. Under employment, most everybody indicated the majority uh, employed for wages. There were uh, 45 retired, 32 self-employed, um, 12 students, and then two unable to work. They indicated that they were disabled and unable to work. Under sexual orientation, the majority at 224 was heterosexual, and um, quite a few, none of your business, <laughs> um, but the majority were uh, heterosexual. Under gender, uh, gender, we had 176 female, 104 male, we had one transgender individual, 51 did not provide information. We didn't break down the remaining page by charts because there were so many responses. 
Um, we asked religion. We had quite a few that said, again, none of your business. Um, but we did have those that did respond. We had 39 Catholic, 89 that simply said that they were Christian, um, 27 that said they were Baptist, 24 Methodist. Um, we had 10 Protestant, but 86 did not provide, provide that information. Under political affiliation, again, quite a, f a diverse response. Um, and they were quite interesting. I got a few chuckles on some of these. Um, we had 81 Democrats, 43 independent, um, 12 that indicated Republican, though one indicated Republican moderate. Um, we had um, a couple of liberals. Uh, one, we had someone that said they were conservative, but currently a raging liberal. I thought that was an interesting response. Um, and so there, there's a variety of uh, responses there, but the, the major ones are Democrat and Independent. So now Estrus is going to talk about the actual results, some of the feedback that we have received at the community conversations. Um, as individuals have attended, they have filled out feedback sheets, and those have come back to me. We, they've been scanned, and they've been uh, actually looked at by Estrus to come up with some patterns. So Estrus, do you want to take over? Um, and so that's the first two pages of tab one. Uh, and, and that first page is kind of a reminder of how this was framed. Starting with the vision and mission and how we're defining community conversations. And then lifting up the intent behind these uh, because we continue to have some feedback that would suggest you want much more of an engagement. You want this person who has this opinion confronting that person with that opinion and that wasn't a deal. Um, so we talked a little bit about intent and invitation and then list all the questions that these three series of feedback sheets contain. Um, I underline the one for this first feedback because they point to particular patterns, uh, particular um, uh, perspectives about uh, the city of Fort Worth uh, as it relates to race and culture. Uh, so the second page, as you turn over, is how I've clustered these. And these are not uh, isolated um, comments. These are clusters. So there are several comments that led to these being the, the ones that emerged. And the same thing for the next two pages around uh, ideas and solutions. These are not singular ideas. These are clustered of ideas. I haven't prioritized any. I just listed them as I read through the different files, the, the different feedback reports. Um, so the first one, uh, looking at page two, uh, looking at the first and second conversations, the one that were underlined, here's what emerged. There's a strong consensus that little or nothing is being done by the city to improve race relations, racial equity, or cultural awareness. Or most people don't know about anything being done by the city. Uh, the city continues to be reactive rather than proactive. Um, these community conversations are one step uh, by the city of Fort Worth. The second area clustered a number of, 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 of um, topics related to critical areas of racial, ethnic disparities reflecting racism and other biases from their perspectives, which includes public school education, housing, and gentrification was cited several times, transportation, fair employment and economic development, infrastructure investment in black and Hispanic neighborhoods and overall a lack of transparency. The next big pattern, a long-term entrenched segregation, patterns in residential housing, education, schools, neighborhoods, businesses, churches, organizations, and city celebrations, and little interaction at large scale between different races, and especially wealthy and poor. Um, other than a few select events and groups, our celebrations and gatherings reflect segregation patterns. And then the problem uh, that was named early on in response is systemic structural and institutional racism and not simply personal or individual acts of racism. Leaders should know the difference. Uh, often cited was a lack of diversity in arts, music, cultural events. Uh, and there was a, a, a good pattern that suggested to continue and expand, continue, expand, and deepen community conversations and clarify measurable outcomes and to create a platform to continue these race and community conversations. And one that came up in some conversations 
with host organizations, and it came up with particular participants, and that is a need for more efforts to bridge the black and Hispanic divide. So the overarching reflective question that I would offer is, what might the city of Fort Worth look like if it championed racial equity? How would the city look and function differently? Now you'll find, again, if, if this landed kind of negatively, it softens when you read some of the other feedback. So this is just those mostly actionable items that point to, to the problem, but, it, but it's not all about problems. And you'll get a flavor of that as you look through these, read through these 38 ideas and suggestions that different uh, neighbors had offered. And I trusted them in communication and engagement, diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, economics, poverty, and disparities. And there's some other ideas in general uh, just that then fall neatly under all of them. They're not prioritized, but you'll find substantive perspectives uh, that can give some insights on what's possible. And then last but not least, again, we've said from the beginning uh, that we're, this is not a new game in town. Uh, for some of us, we've been on more race and equity and culture committees than we can name on two hands. Um, and there are systems that have been recently involved in substantive work around race, equity, and culture. And so I just lifted up a few of these. Uh, Max is here, uh, here, somewhere, all right. Uh, and so at the very top, the TCU Diversity, Equity, and Inclusiveness Committee, and I just did a little bit drawer about what they're focused, but I can't capture all of it. It's significant. Uh, and their alignment and connections with the fourth IC Racial Equity Committee, uh, and then Division of Equity, Equity and Excellence. We know about the police department's um, national initiative for building community trust and justice. Some of us are aware of the Early Learning Alliance Racial Equity Task Force. They have some particular language, and these, all of these processes are well into the, uh, beyond, a, beyond a one year. Uh, fairly recent is Tarrant County College's Intercultural Student Engagement and Academic Success Program targeting male students of color, one target population, and this is on all their six campuses. So just to give a flavor uh, of how do we appropriately align uh, with what's happening and, and connect the, the different voices and community conversations, and then, then later as we begin uh, to get insight on the disparities assessment that uh, Leon will be lifting up. So this just gives you a flavor of the content of the community conversations. And I just so welcome any questions. Anybody have any questions? Uh, Angela or Estrus, based on the information that you're hearing about? I, I have a question, just sir. On all of these committees that are surrounding the city, as far as connectors, do they are they ever in the same room? as far as in planning and because these are a lot of different stakeholders within the Fort Worth community. So we've to some degree, some of those actually were host organizations. Sure. And we've had participants from all of those that participated in community conversations. So there have been linkages and the key is how do we, for example, align some of the subcommittee work with these with the work that's going on. I um, also want to name when we selected Host organizations, you know, we had criteria, but part of that criteria was an intent to do something more than just this first round of community conversations, because we've got models and approaches for civic engagement around race and ethnicity and culture already within our communities. And so we're, we're, we were hoping that some of the host organizations would take it to the next level. And just as a sample, so I sent this to you for the last meeting, we didn't really discuss it, but there are various models uh, that we also would be looking at to include uh, dinner conversations, um, community conversations in the arts, courageous conversations that's been a powerful resource uh, within our schools. Uh, I think both Walter and Katie and a few others each have suggested some models. So part of the possibility is as we move beyond these first round of community conversations, what are the models, what are the distinct models might we offer our broad community rather than assuming one size will fit all? What are some unique pieces? And also included in that is seeing God in one another. I think that's an Episcopal model for racial equity. So we don't have a shortage of models, 
What we need is clarity and focus, and then following those models to see what's, uh, what's, uh, what's been affected. cities, especially when it comes to race and equity, and also, I guess, social justice as well. Um, it sounds like this committee, or a committee like it, is one that's going to be, continue to uh, be uh, interacting or standing for a few years. And what I read of this committee, we're, we are to terminate after a year. Well, I think we need to be planning on another committee or whatever, continuing the effort, because this, these problems are not going to be solved in one year. It's going to take a lot of time to get in, get in, in depth in all the things that are going on. And I agree that there needs to be some coordination done because everybody's out there working. If they are working on things, then nobody's really understanding because they're working in silos. So it's got to be able to bring it all together. Right? And so part of this, and your job probably, I can't take your job, but I know you're doing it, is to see what's out there and bring it together. Well, if you remember early on, we talked about that, you know, if we see that we need more time, we will be able to go to the council and ask for another year, uh, whatever the time frame is that we might need to come up with our I'm, I'm not asking for more time us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Walter. Oh, no, definitely. I mean, and I think that's going to be one of the recommendations. Along with the other communities you know. as well. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is a briefing of additional opportunities for public engagement. Michelle. Um, yes. When we um, when we originally mapped out the plan for the community engagement, we talked about doing the large town hall, which we had, and then we talked about the series of community conversations. Um, we've had a lot of those. We still have two organizations, uh, Leadership Fort Worth and Potter's House, who are going to host community conversation, so we'll be able to include more people in that. We had a lot of people submit um, online requests to participate in the community conversations, and as I told you all at the last meeting, we provided those names and contact information to all the host organizations. There was still a large group that had not been contacted to participate, so what we have done is we have scheduled a community conversation to happen in January, and you have the dates. I have a handout at everybody's place. Um, January 11th, 18th, and 25th at Hazel Harvey Peace. I'm working with Estrus on facilitators, and so um, I sent an email to each of the people who had submitted an online um, questionnaire and gave them the option of participating in this one, um, telling me if they weren't available but they were still interested, and then letting me know if they had already participated in a community conversation and didn't need to, to be included in this group. So um, we're putting that community conversation together for January. Um, the ones we're doing with Leadership Fort Worth and Potter's House, that will allow us to target some of the areas where we have low representation, whether that's geographic or demographic, because they're very open to um, the people on their conversations not being limited to like their membership. So we'll be able to, to improve our demographics in some of those areas where we haven't really reached out on some of the groups we want to. The second item on your sheet, at the last meeting, um, it was suggested that we do additional town halls. We have scheduled 12 mini town halls at community centers and libraries. Um, on the one side of the handout that I gave you, it shows the dates and locations along with the map that shows the geographic um, location for all of those meetings. Those will be happening in January and February, and then I am going to have the next large town hall scheduled for early March. Um, I haven't confirmed that yet, but I've been talking with Estrus, and we think we're leaning towards the um, Tarrant County Community College Southside campus, because that was recommended by a number of groups. So we're hoping to have that scheduled for early March. Um, the website, um, the, the tool that I needed to upload all the documents I got today. So before this meeting, I was able to upload most of our meeting agendas, meeting minutes, and presentation handouts 
and the rest that I haven't gotten to, I'll get those done this week. So that information will all be available on the website, along with all the meetings. We're taping all the meetings now, and we'll have those available for viewing on YouTube and on the, on the website. So um, I tried to take all the recommendations that came up at that last meeting for opportunities to engage more of the community. And um, if there's other ideas that anybody has, we're definitely open to adding those to the, to the list. But I'm available for any questions if anybody has any. Did we do the app? Have you guys started the app where we can go in the app? Like we can go into selecting an app where we can put questions on there? We, to we'll develop an app to develop for an app. the... Mm -hmm. That's way on my <laughs> 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 I'm doing a good job making a website. But we can definitely look at it to see if there's some kind of engagement tool that we could have that would be, we would be able to be a little bit more interactive. But on the onefortworth.org, though, it ha doesn't have a space... You can have a place to submit comments. For, right, for yeah. comments on that. That's yeah. been in place. And I've had a few people who specifically have used that to um, sign up, to, to be part of the community conversations, to let me know they're interested, to just provide comments. Um, but mostly they've seen on the video a presentation and they wanted a hard copy and I've just gone ahead and sent that to them when they request it. So, but we do have that email option for people to ask questions. Yes? Without making assumptions with the mayor's stance on SB4, uh, do we, again, not making assumptions, how are we reaching, I'm looking at this uh, chart here with the, the Hispanic and Latino Spanish population. Are we doing any, not necessarily extra efforts, but what are we doing to engage the Hispanic population to get them out of these conversations? I mean, besides some of the organizations that hosted community conversations. Right. United Fort Worth. Uh, United Fort Worth. They did theirs with downtown Fort Worth thing, so it was a totally different population. Uh, because I was going to ask that question here because we we're missing the north side of Fort Worth and even some of the inner south side, uh, which is predominantly Hispanic market, uh, where that would be an opportunity to hear them in, Hispanic, in, in their own language. Okay. okay. We can definitely add some, um, some town halls, uh, um, specifically um, offer them in Spanish so that we have the, the staff available to do the translations and stuff. So we can definitely add that. And I think it'll be wise to utilize some of these kind of organizations. Um, I forgot who we were on the email chain. Yes, yes, I think we need to tap into some of those Hispanic uh, organizations to let them know that, you know, first and foremost, it's a safe environment to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that is like, one of the things we deal with, with Blue Zones is no one wants to give their name and information yeah. and right. put that and submit that to anyone. So some kind of way we need to let them know that this is a safe area, right. a safe place to come and share their concerns about their community. So, Casa Emigrante and the Casa Zacatecanos would be, uh, the Federal Zacatecanos would be in that, those two groups would be good. And I know too when we were working on our initial SB4 communications, <laughs> it was suggested that maybe in some communities people actually have like meetings at their homes to reach out just to their neighbors because being in a public meeting in a public place, there was still that that element of fear. And so we, we can definitely look at those options if we want to have smaller get-togethers in, in a safe environment. And one of the things you might think about is the Latino Peace Officers Association, because back in 2004 and five, they worked with the banks and the Hispanic Chamber uh, in those markets because they were able to get a particular card to be able to help, uh, open a bank account in a whatever bank, whether it was uh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, or some of the others, because it was a safety issue. So uh, they really did a great job of um, competing there, the Latino Peace Officers. Okay, we can definitely do that. Did we reach out to uh, Tarrant County Sheriff, the police chief came, but have, have we reached out to the sheriff to have him come before this commission so we know you know, I, I don't know that we did, but I actually had a call in the past couple weeks asking when the sheriff was going to be here because they understood that he was coming, which I didn't know anything about. So I certainly didn't know that he had been invited. Uh, I'm not aware of any invitations to the sheriff. We're going to be happy if it's a world of passports, we'd be happy to invite him to the next meeting. Any other questions?
questions of Michelle? Are the, are the town halls that are listed in the blue box there, are they going to be similar to how the, the first one was held and where we're attending, or how, how will that format be compared to what we had before? On the, on the original town hall, we asked people to, um, to let us know what they wanted the task force to address, what, was the, what did they think the main issue was for the town hall, for the task force to address. And we have a, a question prompt that came up during the co-chair meeting, and I, I didn't feel like there was a consensus on having a question prepared or just letting people speak freely about issues that they thought were, were facing the community. So we can do either way. Well, I almost wonder if some of these might even be better served as a community conversation, given some of the locations, too, and mirroring with the demographics that we've seen where you want to actually improve the response. So the far north area, as well as in the Diamond Hill area, and in some of the southwest and the, the southern parts of town, if these are town halls, like what we had before, where people just came and gave comment versus a dialogue. So that's, versus the community conversations that will be held at Hazel Harvey Peace. So I'm just wondering if we need to flip flop it maybe, or I, I'm not sure what the format is. Well, and we also have the opportunity, like with, um, we could host another community conversation in another area if, if we'd like to do that. Well, I know we also talked about the, the, the format and Estrus, you talked about maybe structuring a little bit, so because that was one of the barriers for some folks to participate was, you know, three nights, six hours, all those kinds of things, and even some of us that participated, some of us got through it faster than others, and so I just, I'm glad to see that we have more dates and times and things already locked in, but as far as utilizing them the best way, way we can is what my question is. So making these well, more of kind of a hybrid between the town hall and the community conversations versus just where people come and see. Right. And focus yeah. on a one one time, one event instead of multiple. Yeah, uh -huh. I think we can. Why don't we work on something of that nature? Okay. Because what concerns me when you look at the number of people that have participated in these community conversations uh, or leaving comments and so forth, it doesn't reach the population of our city. So we're not hearing from a lot of people, right. and we need to. Right. I was just going to uh, go along with what Jennifer was asking about. And that is, I, I assume that these are going to be smaller, uh, smaller number of people, which gives an opportunity for dialogue, indeed. And depending on who the moderator is, you can have that dialogue, and you can get a you know, to a lot of questions and answers. Uh, I don't see any reason why that can't be dialogue um, in all of these. Walter? I was just wondering, I looked at the uh, meeting location. I just wonder, would you consider a stop six or a Meadowbrook because you kind of miss that area altogether? A stop six community center or a Meadowbrook? Because you've got to the north, you've got the, the East Regions Library, which is actually above I 30. And then you've got McCrave, which is more south to 287. Yeah. And I had a conversation so you with. The, the, you missed the core of the population. Right. Had a conversation with Historic Stop Six, and they're interested in hosting one at the, at the community center. Where that, would be, that would be the best spot, yeah. Stop Six Community Center. So are they looking to host a community conversation? Or <coughs> Uh, the post was what, what we designed. I think they would be open to a one event rather than a series of three yeah. that can be modified. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Can you get us that modification uh, so that we can take a look at it? Okay. Yeah. For our next term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything that is going out maybe in the water bills coming up next year, early next year, that might provide an opportunity or a survey of some kind for people to provide back? Or something so we could get to more people possibly as well their insights I mean well if you seem to go there you could talk about some of the marketing dollars the city uses for the billboards or the bus stops or the bus wraps I mean, the, those are that you know, the bus wraps and the bus stops are totally uh, separate from the city because that's the uh, Fort Worth Transportation Authority 
Okay. Understand. Just so saying, if we're trying to get the word. If we're mailing already, if we were to mail something, I mean, it would obviously take some funding, but that would also provide an opportunity for people to provide input that might not be taking a lot of time, which seems that's maybe the biggest issue, is people providing the amount of time. <coughs> but the insight, people would be willing, I'm sure, to write something and we could get a little bit more information from people as well. I think also if we put some stuff in the community center, maybe where they can, a postcard where they can write where it's already, they don't have to put money into it, it can just be sent back, that might be a, a great way to get to the different communities more information as well. Well, and one of the other things is the uh, people that have posted us in our community conversations. If we can send them something of a small little survey or so forth, then they can send it out to their memberships and their contacts so that we can try to get more information in. Yeah, I love that idea. Right. Yeah, I don't have like a question, but more so I don't want to commit other everyone else's time. But do we think that the, the task force should have some type of presence? at these town hall meetings if it's at least two or three people because you know I, I you know you don't want people to <laughs> yeah, that show feeds up into the request. <laughs> uh, I don't you know I don't want people to show up to these various town hall meetings and ask them so what are we doing just in your you'll talk be getting about. you'll be getting the first list that we're passing around so you get your first voice right yes. there. We will, we will be passing around a list just like the uh, conversations where so, not all of us need to go but some of us can go to different ones so there is and if you can make all of them great if you can that's I think that goes back to what we were talking about on that email conversation on how if we begin to partner with one another as a task force and utilize our relationships, there are some people who we know in our circles that have not been able to, for whatever reason, to participate in the community conversations. But if we picked up the phone and called and said, hey, I got this going on on this night, I'm thinking we can possibly get more voices by utilizing our relationships. It's one thing just saying there's a meeting going on, but if they know that we, if there's a personal investment that we have, and it's a personal invitation, we might get a higher representation and participation from those that we know that we're missing their voice. Right. I have a question for the guys from the League of Cities. Uh, Y'all have heard us talk about this before and how we get communication out. Uh, what are your suggestions as to how we do this to get more participation? I mean, y'all have done this before. So, uh, so thank you for, uh, I was going to weigh in when it was my time to, to speak, but thank you for asking. I, I, so I do think there, there are two reactions listening to how you're having the discussion. The first is commendable, which is that you're really thinking through creative ways, how to leverage your partnerships, how to find the right locations, making sure you're not um, putting it in traditional spots, but looking at non-traditional places where it needs to, needs to happen. I do think the larger question of our resources of promoting is one that should get resolved like what resources are available uh, through the city to try to, whether it's going through the uh, water, water utility bill or other, other ways of getting the message out. Part of my measure when we come into town is, uh, you know, we, we talk with different people around when we're coming in, just like who is aware of what's going on as it relates to the race and culture task force. Um, and so there isn't a buzz yet, right? There isn't yet a buzz that I could ask a, a, an Uber driver and they would be aware of that they, they've heard about something uh, about this happening. So what needs to happen to create that level of, of buzz, attention, even if people can't show up, but they know it's happening and they know either they share it with their friends or that they, but so what level of investment is there to be able to do that? And I think you're asking yourselves those right kinds of questions that I think will be important. Uh, the second that I was gonna mention um, uh, as well is not to rush this process. Um, and I know that there is a lot of time that's already been invested. Obviously a lot of sacrifice that's already been made. There is pressures of timeline of this only being a year and wanting to make sure you are you know, moving through a process thoughtfully that gets you to a set of recommendations that you want to make. But this is such an important part of what you're doing. Legit it, it, ha it legitimizes the level of commitment that the city and this task force is making to hearing from every person's voice that wants to be heard in this space. And so the message that, oh, we're running out of time, we can't do it, wrong message to be communicating to the community. So uh, I don't know how you revisit that in whatever space you have, but it would be um, my recommendation not to rush this process 
Clearly the demographics looking at what Angie presented, um, you're missing a large percentage of lower income populations, lower educated populations. You have the higher educated people that are attending and that's natural, right? And so you gotta be able to push yourself to find the, um, to where the, that balance is a little bit better and be committed to that before moving on. So those would be the two recommendations we would make based upon the work that happens in other cities. I appreciate that, but let, let me just go back and clarify. I'm, I'm also, I agree with you, but I'm asking, what are some of the things, say for instance we had a budget, what are some of the things we should be do, we could be doing to do this, to get the information out? So, so I, I'm happy to, I think what would be helpful is for us maybe to send something back to the task force okay. uh, that provides a more list of what some of those best practices are for community engagement, and we're happy to do that um, as, as a way of sharing best practices. If, you are looking for other creative ways to do that. So we can pull that together and send that back to the, to the task force. Can you have that to us by the end of the uh, year? <laughs> uh, by the end of the year, uh, I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna introduce Ariel Guerrero in a moment. Uh, uh, I am on the case. Uh, yeah, that we'll make sure you get that by the end of the year. Uh, okay. I, think, I think we can make that. Yeah. I can name one thing of, as a best practices in other places that involves a budget that has been effective, but it's not always used. We're familiar with focus groups that, and from a marketing, strategic marketing perspective, but around race and equity, there are some areas that actually use focus groups where the participants are compensated as a way of getting them in and getting their voices in targeted areas. That it's not about building it and they will come. They go and hold the focus groups where people are, where the institutions and organizations that they already trust, that they're already involved in. But it's a simple focus group, how, find, design uh, questions, uh, and it's been effective in getting the voice. And to, to that point, it, it, couldn't, it could be uh, uh, gift cards you, you pass out, right? Yeah, it's not necessarily right. cash to, right. to a grocery store, uh, local grocery stores, right. or it could be other kinds of financial incentives in the areas that you're targeting. Right. Could be another strategy. All right, I'm going to go ahead and um, go on to our next line out because we do have a couple presentations to go to. So um, if you have any other questions or comments on this one line item, let us know after the meeting, please. Uh, number six is an update on assessment of disparities in service delivery and Linda Johnson and Leon Andrews. I'll just say a few words real quick. Um, all city departments completed a survey related to the data they collect and specifically data that we're currently collecting that we disaggregate by either race or, or ethnic. Um, so, and the results have been turned into NCL. They have, uh, have done their analysis and so Leon can present the findings of that. Yeah, so thank you, Linda. So we, uh, uh, under tab two is the report uh, that we sent to the committee uh, that shows our data governance um, analysis from the survey that uh, Linda just mentioned. Uh, so I do want to just acknowledge that the process here was to ask each agency, 23 agencies within the city, uh, to commit, a, uh, to complete a series of questions that uh, really, really assess their governance strategy for disaggregating uh, uh, data by race and ethnicity. Uh, and so this was kind of part two of the work that we've been doing. For those that heard the update, the last uh, last part, uh, last meeting, we just completed the city conversations uh, that have happened over a series of, over a three-part series similar to what was happening in the community. Uh, this data piece um, is a really important and really us being able to uh, what we hope align with where the task force is going. Um, and so what I want, uh, what I asked um, Ariel Vieiro, who is our newest member to the, our team, he uh, leads our tactical outreach and our support, uh, support team, tactical support and our outreach team, um, will kind of walk through some of the data, kind of some of the results at a very high level. Uh, my big takeaway is I do think there's some good examples in, in particular agencies that are disaggregating the data and some areas where we're uh, not seeing disaggregation happening by race and ethnicity uh, that we want to highlight and we want to go a little bit deeper. So Adiel will walk through some of that highlights and uh, we'll talk a little bit about next steps, what we're looking to do going forward, going into the new year, um, and how we hope that this data can align with the structure that you're creating here uh, that connect to your six community, uh, your committee, uh, committees that we're creating. So I'll turn it over to Adiel to walk through some of the highlights of the data. 
Thanks, Leon. Um, and thank you to the committee at large and the task force. Um, so I want to talk, so as Leon mentioned, there were 23 different agencies that we went ahead and surveyed. Um, we broke them down into kind of four buckets, if you will. Um, city governance, goods, uh, goods providers, business planning and management, and then service providers. Um, so as you'll see in the appendix, in the back appendix A, you'll see how we kind of subset those groups. Um, now, part of this was as we went ahead and looked through this survey, we had kind of two core objectives that we really wanted to, to kind of analyze and get to the core of. One that was understanding the existed data collection practices um, within these agencies, and then two was to discern whether that data um, had already been collected or was being collected um, that examines the racial impact, right, of their programs. A lot of this piece has been around service delivery and how that's affecting said communities. Um, now, though these questions were centered, centered on these objectives, um, what we found was there are some stark differences about how um, agencies have responded, right? Who is collecting data, who has the ability or who's actively doing that, where there is some transition space with agencies collecting some of this data. Um, or, again, this data that they are collecting is not disaggregated, so it's not breaking down um, to the level that we'd like to see in terms of being able to support the task force, especially the committees as they go into um, what they're look charged to do in terms of looking at potential recommendations of how their programs are impacting the communities that they're serving. Um, what I want to do is, um, what we heard, again, overwhelmingly, um, was that no, most of the agencies are not disaggregating the data. Um, there were kind of three core questions here that kind of stood out. Does your agency track, um, does your agency track agency or city, city leaders outreach to residents by race, ethnicity, and or geographical region? Has your agency reviewed the impact of economic development programs and differential impacts by race, ethnicity, or gender? And the third one was, has your agency analyzed equity within agency city um, city leadership outreach. So again, 65% of the respondents, the 23 responded no. Um, now you'll have, each of you has the full survey question. Each of the respondents will be broke down into these four different um, subcategories that I had outlaid before. Those last three got some specific questions directly, they're kind of directly related to their body of work, if you will. So goods providers got, um, had, one question that was different, for example, than city governance agencies. City governance agencies had three additional questions outside of um, outside of the seven standard questions that each agency was asked. So again, this is an appendix B. Um, so I know it's a lot, to, so I'm happy to answer questions on this. Um, I think one of the highlights that I want to kind of pull out here is that, again, the, the disaggregation of data is not across the board. Overwhelmingly, the majority is not disaggregating data. And as you look at your charge on this task force and the committees get ready to get their work into the new year, that's important, right? That data is going to inform some of these conversations. As Leon mentioned, one of the pieces that we're looking at in terms of next steps, that we have highlighted some agencies that have a number of areas um, that are, that do collect this data and are disaggregating. So we've made three recommendations. Um, in terms of agencies that we're looking to have some continued in-depth conversations about the data they're collecting, how they're doing it, the process, the staffing, you know, all the different um, uh, components that go into that and how they're collecting the data. That's going to be the Neighborhood Services Department, Municipal Court, Planning and, and, um, and Development Department. These are three agencies that, again, based on their responses, we're seeing that they're collecting a wealth of data. Um, and we want to understand what they're doing with it, how they're using it to inform policies and decisions, right? Again, the structures that are going in, not necessarily reinventing the wheel. How can we then take some of what we're learning from what they're doing and then use that to scale across the board for other agencies? Um, at the same time, we want to learn about some of the challenges, why the majority of the agencies are not, right? Or they're having struggles or challenges in terms of not being able to disaggregate the data. And so, outside of just those conversations that we want to have in depth with the ones that are doing it well, or at least that are that have a wealth of data, um, I don't want to say that necessarily doing it well yet, right? To have a wealth of data that we can look at, we want to understand the challenges from the other agencies. Um, and so, we're looking to the task force. Um, we've highlighted some that require some further analysis: uh, financial management services, the internal audit, public events, uh, convention center, 
Transportation and Public Works Department and the library, right? We're looking to the task force to think through, right, which agencies you'd like to have more of us to have more of those conversations. We also recognize that the impetus to the task force development, right? So we don't have the police department as one of our recommendations for the three in-depth conversations that are collecting data. Now we know the police department is collecting data, they are collecting disaggregated data. And part of that thinking and rationale, um, and again, these are only recommendations to the task force, so happy to work with you if you want to include them in here, and this is a piece. But the thinking is the police department being involved um, in the work that they have been involved with, uh, I'm just blanking on the other initiative. The, uh, the National Bu uh, Building, national, sorry, yeah. building uh, Trust so, Initiative. Yeah. So the work that they're doing with the National Building Trust Initiative, right, not necessarily wanting to duplicate the work. Now, does it mean that we can't go dive into their disaggregated data? Because we know that they have been doing work around that already. Trying to understand how that disaggregated data is informing policy decisions. And so we might not necessarily be at a starting point the same way we are with the other three departments. It may be a different conversation that we have with the police department. And then what does that mean as we work with the committee moving forward? Um, we are going to obviously work closely with the committee in terms of being able to inform and share um, the data and obviously the, the interviews and the kind of focus groups that we have with the departments and what information is coming out of that and how that can inform um, the committee's conversations really around what recommendations you'd like to make um, coming out of you know, the task force and its year of work. So that's a very high level. Um, I know there's a lot. This is, I think, part of the beginning steps of this. Again, I think as the committees jump into the next few months and wants to really dive into the data and what it means in terms of policy decisions, that's going to be a space where we're going to start to dive into not only the disaggregated data or, again, the lack of, and understanding how that's affecting policy decisions and where that may lead in terms of the conversation or recommendations with the committees. So, and so, so that's um, for me. Just want to uh, talk a bit, to be very clear for us as we, as Ardeal walks through the kind of the details of the survey. The high, for us, uh, if you go to page six of the document, um, in the document we sent, uh, what we were able to the chart broke down the list of the agencies that uh, had identified data that they are disaggregating um, the, within each of their agencies. Um, and what we did initially was, uh, oh, this is under tab two uh, for those, uh, on page six. And so we identified at least initially where that data was that they have identified that they are disaggregating by race as it aligns with the different committees that this task force is creating to try to begin to show kind of what, at least what's been reported of data that's being disaggregated by race and ethnicity, where it potentially could align as the committee's charge is to begin to look at um, the understanding of that the disaggregated data as it relates to your committee. So you, you count the number of agencies that say that they're disaggregating, it's about, it's 11, right? 11 of the 23 say that they are disaggregating. What we don't know is to what extent, right? We don't know uh, the disaggregation is happening by race and ethnicity. Is it being done at a geographical level? Is it being done by zip code? Is it being done um, at um, other layers, it helps us begin to do some kind of analysis. Uh, so the follow-up next step for us going into the new year is to begin identifying at least the three agencies that seem to uh, indicate that they are disaggregating a number of things by race and ethnicity. We want to be able to better understand what level of disaggregation does that look like um, as we work with them to do some initial analysis around what that, uh, what that narrative is as we understand uh, whether or not disparities do exist by race and ethnicity. So that level of in-depthness within those agencies are important, but I also want to make sure what doesn't get lost, we're not ignoring the work that's happening with the police department. What we are, because the police department is also very critical in this space. Um, and so we are, the work that we're doing with the police department has a different starting point. Um, they are part of this National Building Trust Initiative. Uh, and so we, uh, the chief has approved uh, that the evaluators that are doing the data, which is the uh, Urban Institute, uh, that they can give us access to that data. So we, they, we are now working with them. We've signed off on some paperwork for us to now have access to the data that 
the police that they have been collecting on behalf of the police department. So it will give us a different sense of what level of data is being disaggregated by race and, and ethnicity. And our goal is, is to then follow up with the police department to better understand um, that level of disparity and, and, uh, and be able to report that back to the task force. Uh, so you have that information. So it's not, while they're not listed here, they're still one of the agencies that it's important for us to follow up and understand the level of data that is being disaggregated and what the disparities look like within the police department as they're doing the work. So we're just working differently with, with that department. But it's also important for us that we are not uh, only looking at agencies that say that they're disaggregating data. We also want to identify at least one to two agencies that say they're not disaggregating, but we think there's opportunities for them to disaggregate data by race and ethnicity. So we want to, going into the new year, sit down with them, uh, with a couple of those agencies, to, uh, to see if we can better understand why they're not disaggregating data by race and ethnicity. Are there opportunities that they could be able to do disaggregate by race and ethnicity? And we want to make those set of recommendations back to the task force um, based upon what we've learned from those from those interviews. So a lot of the work that Ariel and, and our team will be doing will, will be in that follow-up, the in-depth work that will provide some more insights into where these agencies are as they're disaggregating data by race. I want to provide you two quick clarifying points. So one was, so on, the, on this chart you're seeing, um, transportation was the one unique space where they're not disaggregating any data. So you will see that on the chart. Um, though it's part of the right, the larger picture of who is act, they are collecting data, but they are not disaggregating. I think that was a very unique piece. So I want to make sure that we clarify that. The other piece to this was um, we got two responses from in the aviation space, if you will, because we recognize that Fort Worth, right, um, the airport, and then the aviation department are two separate. And so we got two separate responses. So if you look at the data, we say 23 agencies. Is it you know two different respondents in the same agency? Because part of it was also, um, there was autonomy. We didn't know if there was an option in, in terms of who was it. So I just want to make those two quick clarifying points as you look at some of this data. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Let's get in about some presentations coming up. I just have one. Okay. Do you happen to have a, uh, when I'm looking at the information provided, other cities that might be exemplars <coughs> to some of this that you could provide to the task force yes. so that when we're looking at this, we can see what it compares to, yes. yep. that would be helpful. Yes, yep. we could do that. Very good question. Well, it would be lack of understanding on my part, but I looked at the transportation and public works, and I think of public works. I'm thinking of streets. I'm thinking of, and I know when I drive around, I know you do, there are neighborhoods that are neglected in terms of streets and other yes. infrastructure. So are you saying that that the department that oversees the building of streets is not collecting the data by ethnicity or race? So that's what's what they've indicated, which is to your point, uh, one of those agencies we want to sit down with to understand um, uh, why they're not and, and to explore um, ways that they can. We know in work we do in other cities, uh, it's a, an important agency to disaggregate data by race and ethnicity. Um, as you're making decisions about street lights that are going out and roads that need to be fixed and et cetera and et cetera, and e even if you're not, and so, so some of the questions that we asked were, even if you're not connect, connecting it by um, uh, race and ethnicity, are you at least connecting, uh, collecting data by, ge uh, by geocodes, by looking at zip codes or other ways to help you uh, make some analysis? So it's a little bit surprising that that's not happening, so we would want to be able to sit down to uh, understand that, and maybe Linda might have can I say something? Yeah. And so I think that's why we need to take a deeper dive. So yes, the street department does collect a lot of data. Sometimes to look at it, it ways like you're talking. We've got to combine two different data sets to come up with the results. So when the department answered this, the data set they're thinking of that they're collecting the data in, they may not have um, race or ethnicity in that because usually you don't in some of those databases. They would have to combine it based on some other databases we have in GIS and that to come up with those maps and that. Yeah. So it's a combination of other data sets. And, and again, the other part that's really surprising, and already will here on this point, but I don't want it to get lost. While there are agencies that said that they are disaggregating data by race and ethnicity, the glaring part of that was objective two. 
uh, in some questions 100%, in some cases 65% of those agencies are not doing anything with the data, right? So even if you're collecting the data, you're not using the data to understand the impacts of disparities, right? And so there are sets of questions of what can you do to better, if you are collecting the data, to the extent it's good data, that you can be at least using that to help inform your decisions, using the tools. So part of that in-depth uh, conversations is to better understand, is the data collected at a level where they can do some of that analysis? And part of what we want to be able to do is to offer some of that analysis with the data that they currently have to see if how do you tell that narrative, but then also to make the larger point about how does this translate into some of the other agencies that are disaggregating the data by race and ethnicity. Well, thank you, Leon. Um, Going to go, got some time. Uh, we'll go ahead and go on to the next line item, briefing and strategy to increase minority representation on Fort Worth City Council. So we've got Charles Boswell and Casey Hitch. Thank you for giving us an opportunity tonight to explore for a few minutes uh, something I think is very critical. You'll, you'll recall uh, a couple of months back, I think I introduced a concept related to a different way to do city council redistricting that is citizen driven and really takes the politicians um, out of the process. Why this is so critical is this is where policies for the city of Fort Worth start with your elected officials, which are the mayor and city council. So they are gonna drive policies on all the things we're talking about here, economic development, mm -hmm. health, uh, transportation, what, what have you. We, to reset the stage a little bit, we have a historic opportunity coming up. Um, as you know, uh, the census, the federal census is conducted every 10 years, so that'll be happening again basically two years from now, in 2020. The, the lines always have to be redrawn after the census to, because those districts have to be in proximate uh, equality in terms of number of people. I think we have a rule of we try for no more than a 5% deviation from uh, the average. Uh, but this is even more special and truly unique because by virtue of what the voters of the city of Fort Worth did in the charter amendment election this past May, we will be going from an 8-1 council district mayor structure to a 10-1. So there will be two more districts added following the 2020 census the first actual election under that 10-1 plan will be in May of 2023. So everything is going to change, right? So I'm well aware of the fact that this is not one of the charges that the city council has asked us to weigh in on. However, I'm being presumptuous enough to say this is an an opportunity uh, f to address a very critical issue related to race and culture. If you look at the situation now, we have um, out of the nine elected officials, we have two African Americans and one Hispanic. We know our city is majority minority or minority white now, and it's trending that way more in the future. So it's not it's just a situation where if we stand pat, the, the status quo is going to maintain. It could actually get worse. In other words, if you ha end up with, say, 3 of 11, that's less minority uh, power on the council than 3 of 9, right? So how these lines get drawn is, is extremely important. Um, so be I, beginning with the end in mind, I would like us as a body to be able to say to the city council that when you approach this redistricting process, the goal ought to be to end up with an elected body that reflects the population of the city they're governing. 
One way to do that, perhaps, is the method that Casey's going to talk about in, in more detail uh, based on the Austin example that uh, he, he was somewhat involved in, where the, this was a citizen-driven process. It, in this, as you recall, in the case of the city of Austin, this was done through initiative and referendum. In other words, citizens signed a petition that said, we want to do redistricting this way. They, they called a charter amendment election, and that passed with over 60 percent to go that way. What we would be asking for the Fort Worth City Council is to not make people go through that process, but on their own to say, this, this would be the fair, the equitable way to do it and uh, do it on, on their own uh, initiative. So I'm going to stop there and let Casey talk to you about the, some of the specifics of how this works and try to uh, answer questions because I know there will be some. Um, and uh, uh, Casey, Casey Tungett. Thank you, Charles. And uh, thank all of y'all for, uh, for the opportunity to come and, and present this idea to, to you guys. Um, again, as Charles mentioned, my name is Casey Tungett, and I'm a uh, commercial real estate broker here in Fort Worth. I focus on office leasing and urban land, and so um, you know, I'm, I'm coming at this initiative just from, I believe it's the best thing for, for Fort Worth and for democracy moving forward. And I'll, I'll kind of start from the, from the biggest picture and, and then come, come down into, into where, where our opportunity is here in Fort Worth. But gerrymandering is the biggest issue that's facing our politics, right? Or that's facing democracy right now. Uh, this, the Supreme Court just took up a second partisan gerrymandering case last, uh, last week. They are now hearing uh, one from a Republican plaintiff, one from a Democrat plaintiff on two separate, uh, um, uh, two separate amendment violations. And it is, uh, it is something that, that could change politics, uh, that could change democracy, could change politics and how we choose our elected officials. In, 2016, in the March 2016 Texas state primaries, that March election decided 35 out of 36 of our congressional seats. It decided all 16 of the state Senate seats that were up for election and decided 135 out of 115 state House of Representative seats. That makes the November election just a formality. And the only way that an incumbent can lose is by getting outflanked by a more radical version of their own party because they know that they're only competing for a smaller set of, the cons of, the, of their constituency, knowing that they're safe to, to win in November. And Fort Worth is in a, is in a unique position right now with, uh, with adding our two additional council districts. Fort Worth has always uh, strived at the city level to remain nonpartisan. And this is a, this is a solution to, to continue to, to be a nonpartisan city government. You know, it, it is, uh, it, it's a way to go through the process the right way. And this is what's going to affect, as Charles said, what is going to affect our future policies for the next decade. As he said, this is the 2023 election. The city council members right now have to get reelected twice before they're even worried about what these, uh, what these new district lines are going to look like. And so I think that there's a roadmap for how we do this, and it's what Austin just did in 2014. Austin has had uh, six citywide uh, council members and one citywide district mayor. They just moved to a 10 single member district, 11 member uh, council setup, similar to, to, to the setup that we'll have when we add our two additional seats. They went through this through an independent citizens redistricting commission. And, and as Charles said, that completely takes the choosing of voters out of the hands of politicians and puts it in the hands of citizens. The, um, the way that they went about it was at the complete dismay of the Austin City Council. Austin City Council historically ran under a gentleman's agreement. S uh, seat one was reserved for an African American, seat two was reserved for a Hispanic, and then all of the white guys ran in the other four seats, and that was the gentleman's agreement for how they, for how they divided up the city. Uh, the city. The, um, the city council did not want this to happen, so Austin forced it to ballot uh, by an initiative and referendum, and as Charles mentioned, passed by 60%, because the question is pretty easy. Do you want to fairly and equitably uh, you know, choose how, you're going to, how these districts are going to be drawn, or do you want to let the politicians pick their voters? So the, 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 big, the, big, piece of, the big pushback that, that, we, uh, that we get a lot is, well, we're not, we're not Austin. And Austin didn't invent this. They, they just took an existing roadmap. The first, uh, the first state to do this on the state level was Arizona. And no one's ever accused Arizona of having you know, a liberal policy agenda like Austin. Conti uh, California continued, to, uh, continued to, uh, to, do, to do the exact same thing on the opposite end of the, uh, of the, pol of the political spectrum. 
What people don't realize when they hear this is that in Austin, this was actually a conservative initiative because there was no way for a conservative to win a citywide, uh, citywide seat in Austin. Now they have, they have, uh, they have ten, 10 single member districts that is, has that is divided representation up equitably. I think that, that the opportunity that we have in, in Fort Worth is, is, is going to be incredibly important and the way that we can then present to, to our state and the larger picture how we do this process correctly. If y'all if y'all have been paying attention to the uh, to the Supreme Court down in uh, San Antonio and the Texas districts that have been that have been ruled unconstitutionally gerrymandered, we we are we are in a place in Fort Worth to show exactly like Austin did that they did that they that this can happen successfully. The crazy thing about Austin's map is they drew this brand new map with ten citywide uh, or ten brand new districts from scratch, and it did not get sued. No one complained. Everybody accepted it, and, and they moved on forward because it was a fairly drawn map. The, when, I, when I'm coming to you guys on the, on the race relation uh, uh, task force for is the way that Austin was successful is they got the fa uh, three faces to come together to push this INR for the vote for the voted ballot, and it was the vice chair of the Travis County GOP party, the chair of the Travis County NAACP, and uh, longtime Hispanic state senator Barry Intos. Those were the three united fronts that, that moved forward to, put, to push this agenda. And all, the, what I have found out is that we would actually require almost three times as many signatures for an initiative and referendum here in Fort Worth as, as in Austin. Therefore, I, I think that that, that, it's a, that that is a possible route. However, the, the path of least resistance is to get that fifth vote at the city council. I've, I've had conversations with four of the eight city council, uh, city council members right now, and I get the, the feeling that your vote lands on the same lines that the SB4 vote will on this, init on this uh, specific initiative. I think the path of least resistance is figuring out how we get a fifth vote and take the politicians out of choosing, uh, of choosing who elects them and bringing in a group of independent citizens. And I'll kind of open it up for, uh, for questions from there. I kind of tried to give you guys a 50,000 foot view on it all. You said you spoke with four of the eight city council members. Which four? Can you I've spoken with, um, with Gina Bivens, uh, Ann Zeta, Dennis Shingleton, and Carrie Moon. And those are you spoke to four plus another one? No, th th those are split two and two on how they feel on the, uh, on the idea. Uh, so, can you repeat the question, Bob? I think I think that time is of the essence on this. As y'all just heard, this is a mouthful of a subject for for somebody to get out. I've been having conversations for coming up on two years with people in the business community, getting getting opinions on on how to on how to most effectively move forward with this. It's a hard thing to to even get across for people to understand. I don't think that that we can start this soon enough. Not to mention, the sooner we start this conversation, the further away they are from actually running for, uh, for these new district, uh, the, the, this new election. What's the pushback? The pushback is the city council uh, giving up the complete authority of the final map. What, the, what, what individuals? I'm sorry? What names are pushing back? Well, I, th I think, think y'all can kind of guess of the, of the four that I've talked to, how those, how those are going to come down. You know, they haven't all given me sp uh, you know, official positions on, on my, you know, just, uh, just uh, conversations with them, but it's come with a, you know, some of the, some of the pushbacks are, well, we're not Austin, we're not, we're not going to do any, any of that stuff. Some of it has been, well, we don't want to give up the, uh, we don't want to give up the authority of the city council. We are elected to make these type of decisions, you know, we are elected officials so we can, so we can ma make the, ma make these, uh, the, these districts as fair as they're supposed to be. And so those are those are some of the things that that you'll that that I've run into just in my initial conversations so far, um, and I you know I think that it, it comes down to to authority and, and power ultimately and and sa and safety. Okay. Uh, Tim, I actually you know I, I want to address this really to Rosa, but you know it's important to everyone. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, I'm actually I'm very interested and very passionate about this, mm -hmm. but. City Council said we're supposed to talk about community conversations, assessments of disparities, leadership training. I think this is a great conversation. 
but is this our conversation? I, I think we can all get interested yeah. in it and want to, but I, I'm passionate about these things that we've been assigned to do. Taking on this, uh, I mean, are we just the strongest organization in town to do that this time? And would it distract us from doing what the city council asked us to do? And that's my biggest concern. I don't want this to be a distraction. I think it'd be great if there's an, there was another organization to do that and this, to help with it. But this is the organization. It's about disparity. That's right. And it's disparity. If you don't, if you have an opportunity to increase minority representation on the city council, you do it. My sister happened to be the city attorney in Austin when this was done, so I'm very well versed on it. And it is. It's common sense. I worked at the Capitol in 1990 when we redrew districts, and it was a joke. Everybody knew it was, and the Democrats were in charge. It was going to be challenged. This is racial disparity representation on the city council. We have two blacks. How many Hispanic? How many whites? How many people in this city? Black and white. So it's, it's disparity. All in favor say aye. If you well, we, we all talked about this. Uh, we all talked about this early on about bringing this topic here and why it was important for this group to hear the rationale about what happened in the city of Austin. And we, at that time, felt that it was important that this task group do, do take a look at this and start looking at making some recommendations. Now, does it fit? I mean, the community conversations and everything that we've outlined are things that our consultant, Estrus, has put forward for us to gather the information. But we've also said that, you know, we're looking at what the city does, but we can also recommend what we need to do so that we do make it more equal for race and culture in the city. Well, absolutely. Okay. I think that's part okay. of our Ty had it. Ty had it. No, oh, okay. Uh, Katie. <coughs> Katie. Well, I just think that part, one of the things we were talking about earlier was what policies and could we suggest, what strategies, what programs to the city. This is exactly fits within our purview as we talk about race and cultural equity. I, I don't see how there could be any question about that. Yeah. And just for clarity, it did come up on community conversations by several groups. So it, it unsolicited uh, came up from community conversations. If I, if Charles, you had a question. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I said this earlier. Let me, let me kind of repeat. I think what's appropriate for us, even though I'm very mindful we were not asked, uh, is to go on record saying the Race and Culture Task Force would like the City Council to commit to a process in the redistricting effort that would, would lead to an end result of a mayor and city council that reflects the community they govern. <coughs> Further, that they seriously look at this Austin model. Now we as a group, we, we can't do the, the work that's going to be required to go through that. But I think it's, it is appropriate for us to go on record with that recommendation. Otherwise, we're missing a boat because we're, we're only going to be in existence perhaps for a year. This is our opportunity to weigh in on something that's going to be significant for the city for generations to come. Right. And I just want to add one thing uh, that I talked to both of you about before, is that Fort Worth was the first city in Texas to vote in single member districts against the will of those who were in power. It was because there were a handful of people who decided that we should have full single member districts. They asked for an election, which the city agreed to, thinking it would be overturned. The people accepted it. And we ended up with full single member districts when other cities like Austin and Dallas and Houston had partial single member districts. <coughs> at all. So we, we, we have set the pace with representation. Now, we didn't live up to it. I mean, our single member district, I mean, we limited space, uh, spaces on the council for two uh, blacks. Two of the most Hispanics, but generally one. Now, the population has changed. So no matter how they draw, I expect some difference. But it won't be a majority of minorities on the city council in 2023 unless there is something done 
regarding that. So I agree with Charles that at the very least we could suggest that we ought to have, and I don't know what committee this will fall under, <coughs> and, and Rosa, you may have to determine that, <laughs> but at the very least we could suggest that the city of Fort Worth should have an independent redistricting group to draw the lines and take it out of the hands of the politicians. I move, if I say this correctly, but I move that we go ahead, and I know we are, we have our committees and we're going to have our list of recommendations, but it sounds as if the majority of us, I don't want to assume that, but can we go ahead and list this as one of our recommendations as we build the others, or do we wait until later on? If this is something that we're all, or we can come to a, 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 a vote, but I feel like it, this is something that we need to, I mean, the way Charles just put it, we just need to put that in writing and expand it as a recommendation. But I said we just go ahead and move forward and let this be one of the recommendations. I second it. Okay. We've, got, we've got a motion and a second. Yeah, Any Chair, other discussion? Could we get some yeah. uh, clarity? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Boswell uh, put the idea in general terms, uh, as I noted it, uh, committing to a redistricting process not specifically <coughs> citing an independent citizen-driven initiative, but a, a redistricting process that will result in the council reflecting the composition of the population. I think I heard uh, Mr. Sanders make specific reference to an independent citizen commission, which reflects what Mr. Tungett uh, was describing. Describe. So I want to be sure that we clarify the motion. Okay. Yes, to clarify, you just said yes. I would like to, the combination of what Charles said, with the motion that with the gentleman presented as well. Yes. But did Fernando capture it? Yes. Okay. So 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 we're reflecting the general language, not specifying a citizen driven uh well, I would, no, no, no. Yeah. Because if I were yes. wording it, I would I would have a, a, a second part to, to urge the to support the idea that we go ahead and consider as a means to move that in. And, okay, more word, your amendment. The, 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 two, the two biggest pieces of this be, I, being, one, ultimately, the, the authority of that final map, and two, using incumbent addresses as a criteria in drawing districts. We're about to blow up these eight districts, and the worst thing in the whole wide world is if the way we start to draw ten, the ten new districts is with eight dots on the map that have to, that have to fall into the right, right ones. Uh, I agree that we need to do something. I think we are going way too fast just trying to say, okay, uh, whatever he said, I will amend, and whatever Bob Ray said, maybe we'll amend. I think this needs a lot more discussion. If at the least uh, more than two minutes to think about what we're going to word to the city council, I know that we all want to say, oh, listen, we just did this. But I really don't want to say, oh, we just did this without actually thinking about it, because if we don't think seriously about what we're going to offer, even more seriously about the words we're going to use, you know, I, I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Also, for the future, when they're going to say, well, they didn't really discuss this very seriously, why should we take anything else they say seriously? I, I, ju I just think this is a discussion for more than five minutes. Time. Is it possible to add it to as a future agenda item? Yes, we can add it to future agenda, agenda item, but then also when you look at the committee structure, this is something that falls in each of these committees. So, so what I would do is I would respectfully ask you to pull your, your, your uh, motion so we can do this seriously, uh, due diligence. I think all of us are serious individuals, and I don't know if we want to put our names to something that isn't seriously considered. Okay, Thank you. Back to our presenters. So, from uh, the process and timeline, where are we in a spectrum of timeline from? And I know since this is two years away, redistricting would then follow right after that for the 2023 election. So, where would we, I mean, just based on what you've seen with Austin, and maybe Corey even could weigh in on this, I don't know, but. From a timeline standpoint, when will the city of Fort Worth have to be doing something? Actually, so. So why, why I said I, th I think we start as soon as possible is because if we find out that we can't get that fifth city council vote 
and the, uh, and the route to go is through initiative and referendum. We have to get 87,000 signatures and, and take it to ballot. That ballot measure passed at six, by 61% when it, when it got there in Austin. It's just the process of having to go through that process and getting it there. The census data will come out in 20. Uh, we'll, 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 or excuse me, the census data will be counted in 20, we'll receive it in 21, redistricting will happen in 22 for this 23 election. And so, you know, time is of the essence to, to, get the, to get this going and get this conversation started so people actually understand that there is another option. You know, I just have one question just out of curiosity. Do you feel like you have not gotten the reception from the council members that you have spoken to? because you don't have the backing of an organization or a, a task force like this, or just kind of just curious to hear your thoughts of, on why you believe you received the pushback that you got. You know, I think that I think that, that the pushback comes from, from something new and, and from, you know, from, from, from stepping on the status quo. I think is, is what some of that pushback comes from. I, I have had some, some support that I've gone into these meetings with through, through business leader uh, conversations that I've had that I've been able to, to kind of, to kind of have, have behind my back, but I saw how Austin did it, and, and Austin did it with a, with a united front, which I don't think there, there is anything more, more comparable to, to the face of, of Austin Initiative than this group here in this room. And, and I think that you guys are, are the group that can, that can have the voice, that can really be you know, be what, what drives it forward. You know, for, for right now, it's been me ta talking with individuals for the last going on two years. You know, now if, if we can get a, 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 group, a group like you guys of community stakeholders that really want to see this happen, you know, this is the opportunity and this is the, this is the setting. Okay, that's I'm exclusive from the history I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to tell you about the text. Uh, any other questions? I just want to say one final thing. I know you said they told you this is not Austin. But 7th Street sure looks like 6th Street in Austin, and Magnolia sure looks like Austin, Texas to me. So it's moving that direction. So I applaud your efforts, and uh, if you need some signatures, you've got one with me. Thank you. I appreciate that. And th th thank all y'all for the opportunity. Thank you. Next on our agenda is a uh, briefing of the Fair Housing. Barbara? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Barbara Asbury. I am the Compliance and Planning Manager with the City's Neighborhood Services Department. And I'm here this evening to talk to y'all about the assessment of fair housing. Um, my role with the City and with the Neighborhood Services Department is to ensure that we continue to receive a certain amount of federal grant funds that we get from HUD every year. We get about $10 million in HUD grant funds, and that is dedicated specifically to help low and moderate income persons in the city of Fort Worth, 100% of that $10 million. And as you know, with federal money, you have a lot of strings attached, and so my role is to make sure that we dot our I's and cross our T's and make sure we continue to receive the funds. So one of the things that HUD requires us to do is to do a lot of very specific planning and reporting documents. And one of the things that we now have as a requirement is to do a fair housing plan. And so what this is called is the assessment of fair housing. <laughs> so I want to give you an overview. <coughs> Please excuse me. Um, so as I said, we have a whole series of plans that we do for HUD. So this, well, I'm going to talk about the role of the Assessment of Fair Housing, which I call AFH for short. What were some key findings in this process that we went through? How we developed the plan, the Fair Housing Plan? And what are some proposed strategies and goals? I'm going to give a very 30,000 foot level. Um, we're going to be talking very broadly. Um, I can talk about this topic forever and ever, but I know um, it's uh, getting later in the evening. So I'm going to hit the high points and I'm happy to answer questions later. So this graphic demonstrates the HUD planning cycle. The bottom one here is the orange is the action plan. The action plan is basically our budget for how we use our HUD grant funds. 
So it's a list of money and activities that we will do. For instance, we do home repair for elderly low-income residents in their homes. We spend about a million dollars a year on that. So every year in our action plan, we have that in our budget. The consolidated plan, which is on the right, the black box, the dark gray box, that is a five-year plan that specifies our broad goals that our budget has to be directed toward. The green box is the consolidated annual performance report. That is the list of who we helped and how we helped them. And so it's a list of how many house, housing units we did, how many homes we repaired, how many people we helped to buy houses, how many people got, got uh, youth programs and so on. So the new planning document that we have is the, represent, represented by the blue box. That's the assessment of fair housing. And HUD's goal for this is to ensure that all cities that receive these funds proactively plan to help use this money to ensure access to opportunity for all people in their community. So they've asked us to plan proactively for fair housing strategies that we will use our HUD grant funds to achieve. So it precedes that consolidated plan. Next year, we're going to be turning our consolidated plan, our five-year strategic plan, into HUD in August, so we have to proceed it with the assessment of fair housing. I got it. Okay, so what were some key findings? This graphic demonstrates what has been happening with the level of segregation throughout the region. This, the, they, HUD considers the region to be Dallas, Fort Worth, that both big counties, and as you can see, Fort Worth is the light blue line, and we had a very good trend going from 1990 to 2000 to 2010. So more recently, there's been a increase in concentration of minority populations. HUD uses something called the dissimilarity index, which basically measures the concentration of minority populations vis-a-vis -vis the white population. Um, when you look at that, you can see that Arlington is becoming a more segregated community, uh, that overall Dallas has had a uh, steeper curve moving upward since 2010. Uh, the best reason that I can think of for this is we all know what has happened to the housing market. Uh, I, am, I work with uh, affordable housing, and that's kind of my key issue is affordable housing. And there is a very significant overlap between fair housing and affordable housing and fair housing choice. And when you have populations that are disproportionately low income and minority populations are disproportionately low income, then they have fewer choices. And so then you have more limited access to opportunity. And our housing market has changed significantly in the past 10 years. Fort Worth used to be extremely affordable, and now it has become much less so. There are two other key findings. We have strong community support for existing strategies that the city is using our HUD grant funds for, for affordable housing and neighborhood revitalization. We did a survey. We got 1,200 and some responses from City of Fort Worth residents, and there's very strong support for that direction and how we use our funds. And there was also definitely recognition by the community, by the survey respondents, that we need to do additional education and community outreach regarding affordable housing and particularly regarding publicly supported housing uh, in order for people to understand exactly what is fair housing because there is some community opposition to uh, affordable housing programs and so there needs to be a lot more proactive education. This is something that the city can take on. So what was our development process? Um, I heard you all talking this evening about how we engage the community. We worked very hard all this summer to try and get people to become involved. Uh, we did five focus groups on some of the topics that y'all will be discussing. We invited subject matter experts to attend. Uh, one of the things that happens when you organize focus groups is not everybody can show up. You invite people and you invite people. So we invited probably about 100 people. We ended up having 40 people participate in our focus groups. We did monthly consultation meetings with representatives from Tarrant County and Fort Worth Housing Solutions and other regional entities that also work with affordable housing. We got fabulous assistance from the Community Engagement Office. They posted a website for us. They, excuse me, a web page for us. They posted our SurveyMonkey online. 
Um, they helped us uh, develop all our community meetings. We did community meetings throughout the city. We did a series of about eight to 10 meetings. We co-hosted the meetings with Fort Worth Housing Solutions uh, because they obviously work with affordable housing. And um, we had about 165 people attend all of those meetings. We also, as I said, did a survey. I'm very proud of the survey results. We had 1,600 responses, 1,268 of them were from the city of Fort Worth. What I will tell you about that population that responded, it was a set of, I would say 60 to 70% homeowners and only 30% renters. However, we did get pretty good representation. I would not say excellent representation. We got fairly good representation from minority communities, particularly the African-American community. In the city of Fort Worth, about 18% of the population is African-American and 14% of our respondents were African-American, so I thought we did okay there. Unfortunately, the Hispanic population, we worked hard to get respondents, but we only got 11% response from Hispanic population. However, when you look at 1,268, when you have a response, that's when 25% of your respondents, 300 and some respondents are, are minority population, I think that we have a fairly good representation of minority opinions in our survey. So overall, what is the recommended strategy that HUD, that, excuse me, that the city has recommended, that the city council approve, and the city council has voted on this overall strategy on December 12th, and I hear uh, Mr. Tucker talking about the need for focus, and that's also a key issue for the HUD staff, the HUD grant staff. We want to focus on a few achievable goals and strategies. There are lots and lots of factors that affect fair housing, lots and lots of factors that affect access to opportunity. As I said, we get $10 million a year, so I want to focus like a laser on things that we can definitely accomplish. And we also wanted to focus on topics that our community respondents, that the people who attended our meetings, that they felt were important, and things that we think will really affect fair housing choice throughout our community. So there is a broad emphasis on that overlap and intersection between affordable housing and fair housing. Because as I said, persons in protected classes, minority populations are disproportionately affected by lack of affordable housing. And then there's a profound intersection between neighborhood revitalization and fair housing. When we have neighborhoods that urgently need reinvestment and uh, they're not getting it, then the people in the communities have fewer choices. So this was a key question we asked in our survey because in part the survey was determined by some key parameters and key issues identified by HUD in their new regulation. And one of the key questions that HUD asked is, what methods do you think will best affirmatively further fair housing? And again, we're talking about what can we proactively do? Uh, Y'all know Angie Rush and her human relations unit. They do fair housing enforcement. So they're kind of on the back end. We're trying to be on the front end. What can we proactively do? And as you can see, the yellow and the blue represent two areas where 80% of our respondents on our survey wanted preservation of existing affordable housing and wanted neighborhood revitalization. The top concerns raised in community meetings, and again, the, the list on the left in this blue chart, those are areas that HUD wanted us to specifically ask the question. And I've listed here uh, concerns from the community meetings because when someone shows up at a community meeting, they're really expressing a concern. You know, they're really invested in the issue, their concern, their identification, their care about that is very strong. So as I said, we had 165 people attend meetings and 115 of those 165 said that lack of investment in specific neighborhoods is a key barrier to access to opportunity. And then the next one there is location and type of affordable housing. A Couple other issues again, loss of affordable housing and increasing rents. The need for local education and fair housing enforcement by private housing providers deteriorating housing stock, availability and frequency of public transportation, 
and again, lack of community revitalization strategies. So you're seeing here over and over the theme again of neighborhood revitalization and affordable housing. When we broke down our survey responses by race and ethnicity, one of the things that I was glad to see is there's really broad agreement on those major factors. We have a lot in common. What I will also tell you clearly is that minority populations have a much greater intensity of concern about the issues identified. So location and quality of schools as a major barrier to access to opportunity. Everyone thought it was important. African American and Hispanic populations had a higher percentage voting for that. Deteriorated and abandoned properties. Community opposition as a major barrier to access to publicly supported housing. And economic pressures, once again, affordability of housing. So the broad goals that were presented to City Council on an MNC that they approved on December 12th, which was this past Tuesday, would be on, in these areas. And we're going to be taking very specific measurable actions toward these broad goals. But again, my goal is to give you the big 30,000 foot level. We want to continue partnerships with Fort Worth Housing Solutions and with private developers for development and preservation of affordable housing. We want to focus on locations that are near employment and transportation. And when projects are proposed inside the loop, we'd really like for those projects to help contribute to neighborhood revitalization. One of the things that we found out through our survey is there is a significant need for additional accessible housing and additional accessibility in public facilities for persons with disabilities. So with our HUD grants, we are going to start dedicating a specific percentage of our HUD grants toward a variety of accessibility initiatives. We already do some of that. We're intending to increase those investments. We want to continue visible neighborhood revitalization efforts, especially in racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty. Now, this is a particular thing that HUD has come up with, a, what they call a racially and ethnically concentrated area of poverty. That's an area of poverty where it's the, excuse me, an area of geography where there's 40% or higher poverty and 51% or more minority population. And so we want to try and target our funds to those areas to the extent possible. It's not always possible, but that's going to be our strategic goal. And again, we want to do more education surrounding the affordable housing issue. We want to educate property managers regarding fair housing so that we can maybe break down some barriers, encourage more landlords to take housing choice vouchers, help Fort Worth Housing Solutions increase landlord participation in the voucher programs. Right now, there will be people who have a Section 8 voucher, who have a housing choice voucher, and they'll go and look. They get a certain amount of time, like six weeks, to go try and find an apartment, and they're turning that voucher in because they cannot find an affordable apartment, even with that voucher. So we want to partner with Housing Solutions to help them with that. And we also want to do broader community education regarding the whole issue of affordable housing so that it becomes less an issue of opposition and more of an understanding, create more understanding throughout the community. So what are our next steps? As I said, City Council approved the broad goals. On January 2nd, we're going to be submitting the AFH to HUD. It's electronic submission. We have to put it in into a, into a software. And from February 2018 onward, um, I'm prepared to provide the data that we collected through our survey or any other data that we have to any of the committees, particularly the Housing Committee. So that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
tonight I'm going to go over the uh, my unit, Human Relations Unit Annual Report. We are a um, certified fair employment practice agency, which means that we can investigate complaints on behalf of EEOC and the Texas Workforce Commission. And we are a fair housing assistance program, which means that we can accept complaints on behalf of HUD and do investigations on those as well as on behalf of the Texas Workforce Commission. And just so you know, um, we have been a FAP agency, which is that Fair Housing Assistance Program, for at least 33 years. We were one of the first in Texas. Um, and we have been a FEPA for over 40 years. So in order to become a FAP or FEPA, you have to have substantially equivalent laws, which we do. And then once you have established those substantially equivalent laws, you have to show that you have capacity to do the investigations. The reason I mention this is that there are several cities in the uh, state of Texas that you would think that have a FAP or a FEPA agency, but they don't. San Antonio does not have a FAP or FEPA, neither does Houston. In Texas, FAP, there is only Austin, Corpus Christi, Garland, Dallas, and us, and then the Texas Workforce Commission. And FEPA, that's even less. Dallas is not a FEPA, we are. Um, Corpus Christi is, Austin is, and the Texas Workforce Commission. So you have to prove that capacity. San Antonio is working on it, but they just recently got the substantially equivalent law, so they've got to now prove that they have the capacity to do the investigations. So in fiscal year 2017, um, we took in 198 fair housing complaints. And, and for the fiscal year, that falls in October 1st, 2016, through September 30th, 2017. The basis for those fair housing complaints, people can full, uh, file a complaint on multiple bases. They could file, say, on I'm disabled and African American, and that is why I'm being treated in a... Uh, unequal manner. So the numbers don't add up to 100%, but in our fair housing complaints, the number one uh, protected basis that people file under is disability at 40%. Then that's followed by race at 34%. And then um, at sex accounted for 13% of all our complaints filed. National origin accounted for 12% of the complaints filed and Hispanic accounted for 50% 50, 50 of those. Mexican accounted for 21% and other included Puerto Rican, Sudanese, Cuban, Colombian, and Nigerian, and they accounted for 29%. Of the remaining cases filed locally, 5% of the housing complaints were filed under retaliation, and what that means is I filed a previous case of discrimination and now they're retaliating against me. I exercised a fair housing right. I participated in an investigation and now I'm being retaliated against. 4% filed under familia status, and the remaining 3% accounted for religion at 2%, sexual orientation at 0.5%, and transgender gender identity at 0.5%. So when someone files a complaint, they have to um, base it on an issue. So the number one issue for fair housing complaints is discriminatory terms, conditions, privileges, services, and facilities in the rental or sale of property. I'm going to explain that just a little bit farther because you can't really tell that from the screen. The majority of the cases we receive are on multifamily properties. People are not being refused to rent. Uh, most of the complaints that we're getting are after rental. They're being treated differently after they, they have signed that lease. So I want to make that clear because sometimes people think, oh, well, they're not being allowed to rent. That's not the case. We do get a few of those, but the majority of them, they're, they, they're alleging that they're being treated differently after they sign the lease. Then failure to make reasonable accommodations and failure to make reasonable modifications is next at 30.81%. Then refusal to rent, like they won't renew their lease or, or some reason along those lines is 27.27%. And then inter intimidation, interference, coercion, 17.17%. 17 
Refusal to sell is only 0.51%, and then other include steering, false denial, or representation of availability at 4.55%. Now, in fiscal year 2017, we closed 179 cases, and uh, you can see that it really varies. The, you, the, you look at the numbers. The reason there's a big dip in fiscal year 2015 down to uh, fiscal year 2016 is HUD changed the rules on how we could file cases. We used to file companion cases, like not only would I file against, say, a manager of an apartment complex, but I could file a case against the owner too. Now they say unless there's something very significantly different, they have to be filed as one case. So that caused that big decline from fiscal year 2015 to fiscal year 2016. Closure types. There are several ways in which we can close a case. We can have administrative closures. Um, this happens if someone withdraws a case, we can't find them. Um, we can, if we don't have jurisdiction over it, if we took the case and then as we look into it, um, the individual, the property only, uh, owner only owns two properties, that's not covered under uh, the Fair Housing Act. Um, if those are the type of administrative closures. So in fiscal year 2017, we had zero administrative closures. Or someone could conciliate, settle, or withdraw with resolution. 65% um, of our cases in 2017 were closed that way. Um, also, no reasonable cause. That means it went through the whole investigation and um, we weren't able to conciliate. So 34% are no reasonable cause to believe discrimination occurred. And then reasonable cause de determinations. That is, we, based on the evidence that we have, we reasonably believe that there's cause to believe that discrimination occurred. So in 2017, we did have several cause cases. And um, one was, I, I pulled the information because I figured you'd be interested in it. We had a case that was on, um, let's see, it, oh, this was based on national origin. It was a pretty egregious case. Um, the uh, manager was Hispanic, and um, we had uh, the individual filed on, on basis of Hispanic, and we found that there was uh, the statements that were recorded that the manager says, I don't like Mexicans, I think they're filthy, I don't like written to them. Um, the wouldn't make repairs, wouldn't give the name of the owner so that people could complain to the owner, said, if you don't like it, I'll call immigration. Um, it was pretty egregious, and we ended up um, causing this case. Um, we contacted, as we dealt through it, we were originally dealing with the manager, but as we got towards the end, of course, they got a lawyer once we found cause, and then we were dealing with the owner, and we got $4,000 for the individual, um, and she wanted to move out. She said, "I just give me my 4,000, give me neutral reference, I want out of here. And so she moved out, but what we do is called substantial relief um, and public interest relief. We made them go through fair housing training. We made them go through customer service training. We made them put up our fair housing posters throughout the complex. Um, we made them disseminate tenant and housing information cards. We also, um, we had them prepare a fair housing uh, policy statement they have to give all new tenants. And then because of some of the problems that had to do with repairs, like instead of fixing a lock on a front door, they put a padlock on it, which is definitely a safety issue. We had a code do blitzes on the property and subject them to these blitzes until they got this property, um, some of the major code issues fixed. Then we had another cause case that was based on familiar status. This was overly restrictive rules. Um, this particular property said if you, unless you were 18 years old, you could not be out like walking the dog. You could not go to the laundry room. You could not use the swimming pool. And we said, no, 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 no. Um, and we found cause, and um, there's some pretty good legal cases out there on that. And we got compensation. Um, the individual got um, two months rent reimbursed to her. We made them revise their policy, go through uh, training. We asked that they do affirmative advertising. And then, um, oh, and we also, and all these ones that I talk about, the things that we require them to do, we monitor that. And we can monitor that up to a year or so. We have access 
Uh, they have to agree to give us access to their records. We ask that they provide us proof of training. So we actually monitor all these conciliation agreements. So the timeliness of fair housing investigations, we are required to do, uh, hopefully to do them within 100 days. Now there are some cases that are just complex and we can't, but the uh, HUD's measure is 100 days. So our average is 79 days. So we did pretty good there. We did have, ha have some age cases. This last year we have been down a uh, full-time housing investigator. We filled the position and then the individual did not work out so we still have that vacancy and that's been a vacancy for almost a year because the original person in that position um, went out on medical leave for months and then when they came back they came back for a couple of months and then they notified us they were leaving so that really has impacted our timeliness of our cases. And then our settlements. Now these are settlements for the people that have provided the information. Some in their, their settlement agreements, they have a non-disclosure cause and they don't let us know. But for the ones that do, in fiscal year 2017, we collected $124,000 on behalf of our complainants. So fair employment. In 2017, we had 125 charges. They're called charges in employment. We deferred 43 cases. When I say defer, there's either a conflict of interest or it's usually not uh, jurisdictional to the city of Fort Worth. Um, EEO asks us to take those complaints, perfect those complaints, and then they pay us to do that on their behalf. And then we send them on to EEOC. So we had 43 complaints that weren't jurisdictional to us that we sent on to EEOC. And the basis for uh, employment charges, and there's a, I see an error there, it's fiscal year 2017 on the bottom. Um, the majority, it was pretty much a tie between um, uh, disability and retaliation. Um, basically, I opposed a discriminatory practice at work and because of that, now they're picking on me. And then we had 17% that were based on national origin. We had 22% based on age, 34% based on race, and 21% based on sex. And we had uh, smaller numbers for sexual orientation, 3%, um, and we had religion at 2%. So those are, those are typically pretty small. And there's the full report in your binder under five, and you'll even see HUD statistics in the columns, so you can compare what our numbers are to what the national numbers are also. So the number one issue in, in employment was terms and condition at 81%, and that's been consistent for years. And then discharge, I was let go, 59%, uh, or I was disciplined, 27%. Constructive discharge, the difference between discharge and constructive discharge, constructive discharge is you've made my life so miserable I had no option but to quit. That's what constructive discharge is. Then sexual harassment, 10%, reasonable accommodations, 8%, uh, percent, suspension, 8%, assignment, 6%, demotion, 5%, hiring 4% and then all others added up to 8% and that included harassment, wages, layoff, benefits, reference, training, uh, recall from layoffs. So our closures, we closed 95 cases in 2017, fair employment cases. 7.5% um, of those cases were administrative closures, similar to the housing. Um, we might have trouble getting, um, getting someone to return calls. We've had people file that then will not reply back to us. And so we may have to administratively close that because we can't get any additional information. Settlement and withdrawals was 23%. No cause was 66.5%. And we had 3% cause. And of those cause, we had a couple of really interesting ones. We had uh, one against a recycling company. The complainant filed under race, uh, black, and retaliation. She alleged that twice she was called a nigger by coworkers. She did not prevail on her race discrimina discrimination claim because those coworkers were punished. Um, but she, uh, however, she prevailed on her retaliation claim because after she told her manager she had misgivings about working in an environment where she was subjected to those type of remarks, 
He told her she needed to think about that. She's not seven, she's 27. And she should go home and pray and ask God to steer her heart on what to do. When she returned to work, they fired her. So um, she, uh, the respondent claimed that she was discharged for performance issues, but then we found no evidence that there was any performance issues. We looked at all of her performance reviews and we saw nothing there. Um, and there was never any complaints about her until she did compla complain of an unfair employment practice. And they, uh, the respondents also declined to participate in the conciliation process. And what's a little different about employment cases is when they, we find cause, it, they can, you can take it to court, uh, the individual can ask for a right to sue, or EEOC can take it up. In this particular case, the respondent said, I'll see you in court. They just didn't care. So it, that, it's been turned over to EEOC and they've taken it on from that point. The next case was a nursing and rehabilitation, uh, like, like a nursing home. And uh, the complainant claimed she was denied a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. Her job was doing laundry, and the, but the respondents began requiring her to also supervise the residents outside while they smoked. And she was diagnosed with lung cancer and she requested a reasonable accommodation to be kept away from the smoke and she also provided a, a doctor's note saying that she should not be around the smoke. The respondent denied her request and said, uh, they said, you can wear a mask. And so uh, she, the, the complainant felt that she, I just can't go to work. So she quit going to work. And then they said she abandoned her job. And she said, she called him and said, I'm not abandoning it. I just cannot work in those conditions with my lung cancer. And so what we did is we looked at the essential uh, functions of the job. And in nowhere does someone doing laundry require to supervise people outside smoking. That, that, that didn't fly. And then um, they said, well, we'll reassign her to a housekeeping position. But EEO's position on that is reassignment is last ditch. You don't reassign. Um, that you should consider it's the accommodation of last res resort, a reassignment. And because supervising smokers was not the essential function of the job, um, we determined it would not have created an undue hardship for the respondent to remove that duty from her, her everyday assignment. The parties ended up successfully conciliating. She did very well. Um, I don't know the exact dollar amount, but we worked, we conducted a mediation and they worked through it and she was very happy with her settlement. And then we made them go through training and also we made them revise their, pro their policies and practices. And then we had a sexual harassment claim that was pretty egregious. Um, this one, she was complained that she was se sexually harassed throughout her employment, and she had to constructively discharge. Uh, discharge. The respondent CEO made numerous inappropriate comments concerning her body and looks, stared at her, tried to hug her, touched her inappropriately, told her what, your legs don't look good enough, your butt looks better in that outfit. And, um, then numerous witnesses came forward and substantiated all of it and complained of their treatment. And they were all uh, young, female, recent college graduates. There seemed to be a, an issue with the CEO and these young college graduates. And we found cause to believe that discrimination uh, occurred based on the widespread allegations and the documentation and the evidence that we were able to collect. Um, and the, uh, the charging parties attorned attorney declined to participate in conciliation and decided that they wanted to file a lawsuit after we found cause. So they've moved on to the ne next step as they're taking this to court. Um, and then the EEOC is so interested in this case, they're considering pursuing a lawsuit on behalf of all the other people, uh, witnesses in this particular case. So that was a pretty egregious case that we had. So those were the cause cases in employment. And our timeliness, we have to do 180 days for employment, and we did it in 142 days. Um, we only have one and a half, and I say half, uh, employment investigators. This is the smaller side of our in investigations. We have one full-time and one part-time. In our in settlements, uh, we collect the, of, we, of the ones that we know. Now, we know there were settlements that were not disclosed to us. We know that there's $33,623.50. We don't get a, we also uh, investigate public accommodation complaints under the local ordinance. We don't get a lot of these 
And I'm going to be honest, I don't go out trying to find them because of limited staff. I have to assign them to the staff I have, and we are pretty strapped. But um, in fiscal year 2017, we had two public accommodation complaints. Um, of the cases filed, one was under national origin and one was filed under sex, and they were both alleged they were denied equal access to a place of public accommodation. And we closed one case, uh, disability, equal access, and we closed it no cause. We did not find um, any discrimination in that particular case. Are there any questions? Yes. That's any place, under our ordinance, we can, any place that charges money, any place, uh, a city facility, a public facility, any place like that, there are ex ex exemptions for churches and some schools, um, but uh, pretty much any place that someone goes, a, a convenience store, a restaurant, any place such as that, that's a place of public accommodation. Anybody else? <clears throat> Thank you, Angela. Uh, next, next is the uh, appointment of task force committees. So uh, today we have Ty Stinson, who is going to be chair of criminal justice. Thank you, Ty. Uh, Charles Boswell will be chair over economic development. Uh, Bob Goldberg and Robert Fernandez are going to be co-chairs over education. And Yolanda Harper over health and Kay Sheridan over housing. Uh, we did have a meeting a little bit before our meeting at 5 o'clock to go over some uh, information. No, 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 no. Oh, transportation, NEMA, Mallow. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'd like to uh, remind all the task force members that in our most recent communication by email, you should have received a table with the names of task force members assigned to each of the committees. Uh, if you want to change anything about the table, now is the time to let us know. Uh, Madam Chair, we did hear from uh, Mr. Bansby before he had to leave that he would like to be added to the Economic Development Committee, and uh, we're happy to do so at his request. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we should uh, let you know uh, as we uh, advise the, the task force chairs uh, earlier today uh, that uh, the purpose of, of each committee is to study uh, each of the six topics that the community has identified as critical to the advancement of racial equity in Fort Worth, and thereby to provide findings and recommendations for inclusion in the proposed racial equity plan to be prepared by the full task force. Each committee uh, accordingly should perform three tasks. First, to analyze available data and assess resident comments about the assigned topic as it pertains to racial equity. Second, determine the extent to which racial disparities exist and assess the causes of those disparities. And third, to make recommendations to resolve identified disparities. Each committee would meet once or twice monthly from January to April at mutually convenient venues and provide monthly reports to the full task force. Probably the biggest challenge uh, for the committees will be to complete this work within the uh, designated uh, time frame of four months. This is an extremely uh, ambitious challenge. Uh, the co-chair has debated uh, uh, on the basis of comments that task force members provided about the scope of responsibilities to be assigned to the committees. And the, the co-chair is uh, elected to undertake a broad challenge, uh, a broad scope of responsibilities. That is to say, not narrowing it to the appointment of city boards and commissions or uh, the, uh, uh, the hiring of minority contractors. Those are within the scope of responsibilities, but the, the coaches wanted to broaden that scope to include uh, uh, all of the topics uh, that we've identified. Obviously, these are very broad topics. Health, education, housing, transportation, and so forth. Uh, are very broad. Uh, each of these topics has been the subject of extensive study by various groups, not only nationally, but here in Fort Worth. So the charge to the committees is not to reinvent the wheel, not to restudy all these topics, 
but rather to, to review all available studies, uh, to review additional data that you may wish to assemble, to interview subject matter experts in the community that you would identify, and on the basis of that process, summarize the major findings that you can make about your topic as it pertains to race and culture. If you can stay <coughs> focused upon that charge, then I think you can accomplish the work of the committee within a four-month time frame. It's going to be a major responsibility of the committee chairs to keep the committee focused on the topic uh, and on track to complete its work within uh, the defined uh, time frame. Uh, toward that end, each committee will be assigned uh, at least two uh, city staff members. One would be uh, able to provide administrative support in scheduling meetings, uh, in producing minutes for the meetings, in uh, uh, producing uh, the monthly and final reports for the committee. The second city staff member would be uh, a subject matter expert who would not only be able to provide uh, expert advice, but would also be able to connect the committee with other experts in the community whom you may wish to interview. And you have the names of the, of the support staff and the technical staff uh, on the table that you proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, we'd be happy to entertain any questions that the task force may have about the appointment of these committee, uh, committees. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you. Um, as you'll see, our future meetings are listed. Uh, the next one's going to be Monday, January the 22nd here. And then as you all get your meeting scheduled, we'll be sharing that with the whole task force as well so that you'll be able to see when other committees are meeting. And, um, you know, if you want to attend one of the meetings, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Uh, we as co-chairs will probably intertwine in, uh, <laughs> in several of those committees, and so you'll see us throughout those as well. Okay? Madam Chair, if, if I may add, uh, I, think, I think our intent is for each uh, committee, if possible, to hold an initial meeting before the next task force meeting on January 22nd. Uh, and uh, we'd be happy to provide whatever support the, culture, the, ch the committee chairs may need to schedule that initial meeting. Uh, any closing comments from our co-chairs? Just another thank you to everybody, but I also want to add a special thank you to the staff. We just added a lot more work to this. <laughs> I just got to say, I've been impressed. My, my, our, bound, our binders got overwhelmed. Now we've got a file cabinet that's getting overwhelmed. So we're getting a lot of information and work that you've been doing. So our thanks to you for all that you've been doing. And happy holidays to everybody. Yeah, I just want to wish everyone a happy holidays as well. Thank you for everything that you have been doing and everything you will continue to be doing. I feel blessed by all of you, and I thank you and wish you all the best. I would just say, Merry Christmas, everybody, and hopefully you'll have some quality time with your families. I just want to just make sure that we all know the seriousness of what we're attempting to accomplish. You know, a lot of people don't have a voice. We become their voice through the work we do. So please take it serious. <coughs> We've identified the buckets that the information seems to be coming in into. So thank you to those of you who agreed to be a uh, committee, committee leaders. All right, we do have one last uh, announcement, and I'm going to turn it over to Chief Krause, Assistant Chief Krause. Thank you very much. I'm Assistant Chief Bay Krause of uh, the Patrol Bureau. Uh, Chief Fitzgerald is not here today. He's been dealing with a personnel issue most of the afternoon and into this evening. Um, I'm not on the agenda today.
today he has terminated the sergeant that was involved in that incident. He also decided we would go ahead and release the video and that is being done as we speak. The media outlets will have it this evening along with a statement from the police department. Uh, we will make an opportunity if this uh, commission, if this task force wishes to uh, provide an opportunity at, at a future meeting for the chief to come and discuss the incident and review the video as a group. So thank you. disruption and harm and pain. I pray that your peace will overwhelm, your wisdom will be upon every person who needs to make the right decisions at these times. And I pray, God, that you will also um, bring restoration to whoever has been hurt, whoever has been harmed. And I pray that they will be surrounded with good counsel, with wise counsel, and um, more than anything, God, I pray for peace in my city. During this Christmas season especially, I pray for peace in my city, peace on earth, for all people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Merry Christmas. Thank you all. Merry Christmas.